The way that we approach value is very similar to the way we approach just our construct drawing or just you know starting the drawing. Um, we always start simple and go to complex. We take large proportions and break them down into smaller proportions. And so what the, we're going to be doing the same thing with value. So um, on our students only page, we do have the value strip handout, which um, is kind of a lot to read, but that's what I'm also explaining to you. So if you need a refresher, uh, please go onto the students only page and you can download this um, or print it out. And it also is the same instructions. Um, so when we start thinking about value, <clears throat> value is um, the second most important thing ever. <laughs> okay, so the first more, most important thing ever is our technical drawing, the actual drawing, right? Our second priority is value. So value really is what communicates to the viewer form, turning, um, everything else. So the drawing is really important and then we need to build the form, which value does. Um, color is our third priority and that will be for painting so value really does all the work whereas usually color gets all the credit so value 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 okay so when we approach value um, we don't just start toning in all of our stuff and start just throwing stuff down we want to be methodical and purposeful with it um, the first thing that we need to do um, and this you're going to do this every time you try a new medium every time you, you, you use a new paper or canvas or paint new medium or new surface means new value scale. And that's because the value scale serves a couple purposes. One of them is to discover the limitations of your medium. So often we, um, we are sometimes criticized with why don't you just take a photo or you're just copying things blindly. And I can understand why people have that perception, um, but when you come to get some training or somebody talks to you about it, you start to realize we can't blindly copy what we see in real life. And that's because we don't have the capabilities in any art medium to achieve what we see in life. Okay, so we experience this in life, the color spectrum of the, the light spectrum, and our mediums are typically capable of much less, right? So we have to learn to interpret the information we see in front of us and be able to use the medium that we're using and figure out how to make it look dimensional and believable on a two-dimensional surface with our limitations. So the first thing that we need to do in any new medium or anything we're using is know our limitations. Okay, so we're starting out with um, our Statler 2B pencils on pearl gray Canson paper. So that has a different limitation than paint does. So we're gonna start getting to know what our limitations are with our kind of grayish graphite on a kind of grayish uh, paper. So our value range is you know, not huge, <laughs> okay? Um, whereas paint can open up that value range, but we're just working in a limited value range at this point. So the lightest we can get is our paper. We're adding uh, medium to make it darker, okay? So the way that we start um, doing value scales is we have nine boxes. The first one is already done for you, congratulations. <laughs> The second one is gonna be your darkest dark, okay? So that is our largest relationship across value, much like when we start our bargs, we put our largest relationships to, down drawing-wise, right? So to get your number nine, it's not just about going as hard as you can and as dark you can, as you can right away. That's not how we're gonna do this, and, and I'll demo in a few minutes. All right, so order is number one, then number nine. We uh, here at the school currently use the system that one is our lightest light and nine is our darkest dark. If you are familiar with the Munsell uh, value system, color system, or a few others, they do the reverse, but it's the same concepts. Your extreme light that you're capable of and your extreme dark that you're capable of. Again, some of the systems might swap the numbers, light to dark, uh, but the concepts are the same. The third one you're gonna do is your five. All right, you're gonna split the difference. Just like with our drawing, we did our largest proportions and then started to break them down into medium proportions. By taking our five and trying to say, all right, I wanna make sure I have an equal jump from my one to my five to my five to my nine. Those should be equal jumps. So I'm estimating, I have, I'm putting down a hypothesis of what I think my five should be, okay? So that's great, and I have one, five, and nine, that looks great. 
The next ones I'm going to do are my three and my seven. Again, I'm taking my medium proportions and breaking them down in halves, right? So again, we're taking large proportions, breaking it down to medium. So now that we have more information, our three and our seven, we can say, how, how, how did I do on my five? If I all of a sudden have a huge jump between my one and my three, but equal jumps everywhere else, maybe I was a little too light or dark with that one. Okay, so adding a little bit of information, I can now adjust all three of these and say, all right, now this could be a little bit lighter, that could be a little bit darker, this can be whatever it is. All right, so then we get those relationships where we feel good about it. Much like with our bargs, we have those larger proportions, moving the lines a little bit, getting those right, and then putting more information in. We're doing the same thing with our value scale. We're breaking it up into these kind of medium proportions, getting that right, then once you put in two, four, or six, and eight, it's going to be a, go a lot easier. You're gonna have much less drastic changes on the majority of the information you put in because you've started with solid, good relationships. This is an example. This is one that's on chalk and charcoal on toned, I believe, arches. So again, this value range looks very different than this value range, okay? So really, um, this is what you're gonna be shooting for to start. Um, You'll notice how smoothly those are filled in. That is going to be a challenge. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's going to be a pain in the butt. Um, but once you get used to it, it becomes actually very therapeutic and meditative. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you're like me, who has a hard time relaxing, sometimes just filling in some holes is a nice way to just calm down, stay in the present. Uh, okay, so does that make sense as to what is going on with the value scale? Again, doing this with paint, doing this with charcoal, doing this with carbon, it's a great way to just understand what your limitations are with mm -hmm. the medium. Once we've completed this to satisfaction, we're going to do transitions, um, also gradients. Um, so these are the one long one, one medium one, and one short one. And so we're going from our lightest light to our darkest dark without stopping. That is also going to be a challenge, and there's a multiple ways that you kind of approach them. Some people like to break this up into nine and then seam them. Other people like to just work off their darkest dark and um, bring graphite out and then just start to tweak it. Again, everybody has a different approach. Um, and how you approach long transitions or gradients um, are, is going to be different than the way you treat shorter ones. Okay, so this is, a diff this is different than that. You're gonna feel that uh, the applying the graphite is going to feel different and the approach to it is different. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So those are the, for every new medium we do, every new paper you use, you're going to be um, completing one of those things. Okay, so how do we put the graphite down? <laughs> so you guys have been used to the uh, um, ghosty bandy lines. And so the way we're achieving darkness is not by pressure. I want you to start out by trying to layer those ghosty bandy lines, okay? And so by layering and by doing that, we are going to be able to give ourselves the ability to come back from getting our darkest dark or getting really dark values. And if we need to come back from it, by layering it, we're not destroying the paper, we're not destroying the texture, and we're not just completely obliterating what we're working on. We want to be able to give ourselves flexibility of making corrections. And so by using our needlepoint um, razor sharp uh, pencils, which um, we do have another video on our YouTube channel <laughs> on how to sharpen our pencils, <laughs> uh, that these pencils are going to be your best friend for filling in holes and making very even, um, very even tone to be working with, okay? So as you can see here, somebody's kind of already started this. Now, we've talked about before um, the, the airplane stroke, right? Or the, um, the, the ghosty bandy lines, right? Mm -hmm. So ghosty bandy lines. I also call it the airplane stroke because you come in for a landing and takeoff. Uh, so as you're approaching your nine value, there's again a couple approaches my personal tendency is to start with the airplane stroke and I'm starting to layer and I'm trying to have those strokes go one right after the other I don't I'm trying not to do this because it can cause uneven value so you can see with my very sharp pencil I'm using a mall stick here because 
Um, I don't do very well uh, without one. I don't have a ton of control within my shoulders. Uh, so I'm using the airplane stroke to just start to place some value down. And so as I layer it, it can get darker. Now all of this is very erasable. I can clean up those edges on the square um, and I'm just, and you can see it's already going down in a very even way. So to start to approach uh, some of the darker values, I'll typically fill in in one direction. Then I will start to rotate and I will start to layer. So I also want you to understand that your eraser is just an as just as strong tool with value than your pencil. Think of it as your white paintbrush or just one that has lighter values. So do you see how there's no ghost of any of those tones mm -hmm. there? If this were a shape that I needed to fix or tweak, I can get a nice clean shape on that because I've left the paper texture intact. So that just gives me a nice um, even tone just to start. Now eventually this would, this might be a good start just for my five, right? So that, that gives me, I'm, I'm already in a good place where I could likely even this out even more. So now I'm knowing, I, I'm doing this for my nine, but I could say, hey, this is a good application for my five. I'm already at a good place for that, okay? So now as I go in here, I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup and you're gonna see that as I clean things up, my values actually sink down a little bit. So what happens is, is our our paper is a bunch of hills and valleys, if you look up close, correct? Um, so again, we say a dull pencil is just going to mostly hit your mountaintops, right? And that's why we try to ha make sure that we have a sharp, sharp pencil, because a sharper pencil will get more into these hills and valleys. But it's not perfect, right? So we're, you know, doing our airplane strokes and missing some things. So likely, there's a certain point at which you're going to want to come in and start filling in holes. And that means being cognizant of where the paper is being shown through the value, right? So it, I call it kind of t TV static mm -hmm. or noise or crunchy. Um, what we're trying to do is make sure that we don't have high contrast between our valleys and our hills because that creates those high, that kind of crunchy value feeling. And in order to have a more even value application like we do over here, you want to make sure that we're not necessarily making these equal, but making the contrast low enough that we don't notice the texture. So that's really what we're going for here. And again, a very, very sharp pencil is going to be do you a really big favor by being able to get into those holes and valleys of the paper. Now I'm using Canson paper here. We use Canson because it's a very durable paper, and especially for people doing barg, uh, drawings. It's easily erasable. You can erase things off it very easily, but it does have a slight tooth to it. So we're really trying to obliterate um, in those darker values. We're trying to get rid of seeing too much of that texture. So you can see I'm taking my, the tip of my pencil and trying to hit some of these valleys and just place some graphite on it. I'm not necessarily trying to make it the same value as the hilltops. I just want to make sure I get rid of the white of the paper. And so by doing this, I'm going to start, you can see it's already gotten the value quite a bit darker. Some people like to use little circles. Some people will start right from the start by doing this. So then what I also want to do is be able to get my eraser, if there's some mountain tops that have collected too much graphite, you'll get these little dark specks, mm -hmm. right? So your, your eraser becomes very functional now. Um, and it, it will become a back and forth between cleaning up the mountaintops, putting a little bit of value back down, filling in the holes, and just a back and forth to try to get those um, to read. So typically I'll use my eraser to try to attack those mountaintops. Sometimes I go a little too crazy and it gets a little blotchy, but I know that I can easily come in with a very light hand and my very sharp pencil and then put a little bit of graphite down to repair what I did. Sometimes you'll find that some of your mountaintops are really stubborn and they really hold on to that. That's where you're going to want to be a little bit more aggressive and 
use a little bit more pressure with your eraser and that usually means that you have to do a little bit more cleanup than usual. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. So once I have things relatively cleaned up, it makes it a lot easier that if I do want to darken this whole section, um, some of you might be familiar with painting and doing a glaze on something where you're kind of putting like a transparent layer over everything. So in order to get this down to my darkest dark, once I have things evened out, I can use, a, again, a sharp pencil and actually glaze it even darker. And it makes it a lot easier to do this once you have a filled in value. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to try to go as far as I can with the glazing to where I feel like maybe I need to do a little bit more filling in or maybe I need to um, start to use a tiny bit of pressure. We're not going nuts here. Again, we're using a 2B uh, Statler pencil. I want you to try to get a full range of value out of the 2B. If for whatever reason, if you're somebody with an extremely heavy hand who just cannot handle getting the lighter values with a 2B, then we are open to some people using an HB or an H in the lighter values, but only the lighter values. We do this also because using the, as we talked about using these sharp pencils, we're not only trying to get these really nice, you know, finished drawings, but we're also training to paint. And pressure sensitivity is a huge thing. And so we don't want you just going to change what your medium is because you're having a hard time staying lighter with your, with your pencil. Does that make sense? We all, this also mimics painting in a lot of ways in that in order to get darker with painting, it's not about just pushing really hard on your brush to get darker, okay? It also requires that if you're gonna put, be putting black down and you put one pass of black down, you don't get your pure black. You don't get your true statement because of the natural transparency of oil paint. So you need to layer in order to hit. You need to layer usually twice to get that true statement, unless you're globbing it on. Typically here, we're not globbing anything. We're usually using indirect thinner layers. So it kind of gets you in the habit of knowing that you've got to put something down and then layer a little bit more on top of it to get it to be truly what you want it to. So it's, just, it's, it's kind of a, um, that's not the original intentions for it, but um, that's also a, side, a nice side effect. Okay, so typically if you're having a hard time with getting an even tone, it's because your pencils aren't sharp enough. 99% of the time, it's because your pencils are not sharp enough that you are not getting an even enough tone. So I'll do a little bit more here, and you guys are welcome to come up and take a look if you're wondering what I'm doing. I'm constantly rotating my pencil because I find that even just by working a little bit here and there, I will dull the that edge a little bit and then I'll flip it to get a little bit more of that sharper edge. So here, you know, I have a corner here that's starting to approach the goal is to have a dark value without having too glossy of a finish on it. We don't want to, again, annihilate the texture of the paper. We want to be able to erase and come back from this. If you feel like a whole square has gotten a little too dark and you're not sure what to, how to erase, you can see I'm using this little pointed eraser. Um, if you're trying to erase a whole section, I would recommend taking your eraser and making it into more of a paddle. Um, so what that'll do is it'll just, again, it's almost like using a dull pencil, it'll just cross a, uh, on those mountaintops and pull off a little bit, right? So I could easily lighten this whole section with a paddle but still have it feel even, okay? So I can easily come back from that from something that's a little bit darker because I use layering rather than just pushing really hard to get um, the darker value. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Are there any questions about what I'm doing or why? No. So I also find that doing this is nice because by not giving us the texture of the paper that's distracting us visually, it allows us to really explore small forms and how those forms 
uh, melt into each other and really explore transitions. And so transitions, which is like these uh, gradients here, you know, this is communicating a, a tighter radius or diameter of a cylinder, whereas this is much wider, mm. right? And so that is communicating to the viewer how wide this turn is. And in order to, and if, imagine if you have a lot of muscles or, or something going on, and you want to describe how those forms are turning in, 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 into each other, what can be diff what it, it kind of gives you a, an easy way out by not being able to see what's happening on, on the micro level of smaller forms. Mm -hmm. And so by filling in the holes like this and, and having the smoother patterns, it forces you to understand everything. And so we have the ability to get down to those smaller forms and really explore them. So that way, you know, we have the philosophy that it really helps to understand what you're doing and why. So not only are we approaching things optically and saying, we want to make sure we can see everything and we're, you know, we're trying to mimic what we're seeing and interpret interpreting the information we're seeing in life and putting it on a two-dimensional surface, um, but we're also understanding it and we're also trying to communicate what we understand about it. So it's, we, but we marry both the optical and the uh, conceptual, or perceptual and conceptual. And so by the exercises we do and exploring those smaller forms, that's the tighter rendering and the, um, the smoothness of the, what we do allows for us to actually explore those things. So any questions? That's, um, that's going to be what you're going to be doing. So ideally, you finish this before the end of your first bark. And ideally, start it before you've started filling in your shadow shapes.